Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the On The Record Sports Podcast. My name is Drew King. I'm the sports editor at the San Marcos Daily Record. To my left, I am joined by Daily Record correspondent Deshaun Hartley. To my right at the end, we have Jude McLaren, the podcasting extraordinaire. And our very special guest today, we have Texas State head women's basketball coach, Zenere Antoine, a.k.a. Coach Z. Coach, how you doing? I'm doing good. It's good to have you back, Coach, and in person this time. Yeah. Yeah. That's especially good. Um, So, Coach, as you know, we're at the... San Marcos, sorry, Camp Black's Barbecue. Love this San place. Marcus, live from there. So to start things off, what is your go-to barbecue plate? So my go-to barbecue plate, because I don't eat beef, so sorry for all our really? Texas brisket. Yeah, I don't. That's an okay. unknown fact about me. Um, I like all forms of ribs. I like the St. Louis style. I like the baby back. Um, I like the thick cut ribs, the country style ribs. But I also like good turkey. So I think they do a great job here with their turkey. Um, actually, we, we come here as a family, or when I leave the office, and I mm-hmm. grab grab a full uh, rack of ribs and brisket for my kids. And uh, sides-wise, I'm kind of hit or miss, but you know, I'm a Texan, so I like the jalapenos and the carrots, onions, and I have to go with wheat bread over white. Yeah, all right, very good, Coach. Um, so, you're nine games into the season now. You're five and four. Um, tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are on this year's team and, and kind of your expectations moving forward. You know, this year's team, I, I tell people this all the time, I, I love to wake up and coach them. And I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for when you absolutely love doing what you do. Um, I love coaching, but each team is unique. This team is fun, so even when we have struggles, they make it a lot of fun for me. So that's what I really enjoy about this particular team. As I look at where we are now, we're still evolving. Are there things that we've gotten better at? Yeah, for sure, we've gotten better rebounding. I think that's something that we've had to do. Um, we're still trying to figure out identity as far as it comes from where is our scoring coming from. And I think that's where I say we're not exactly where we need to be, but luckily we got three more games before we hit conference play, still watching a lot of film. And, and we'll see, because you know we always have a special player in Denasia Hood, but Kennedy Taylor to me is, is by far um, really what the engine that makes us go. Mm-hmm. And I think that with what she's been able to do over her career, it's absolutely phenomenal. And I'm just really looking for her to take a, a more prominent role from a scoring perspective, but you know, continuously doing what she does as well. And we've got a lot of other pieces, you know. In terms of pace of play, it looks like from what I've seen, you guys have been playing pretty like even killed is and Kennedy's been controlling the offense. How do you think you guys' pace of play has been this year and how do you think it's gonna help you um, before heading into district? Do you think y'all are playing a little bit too fast, too slow, too controlled? How do you That's do a good question, playing? Sean. So I, I I like where we are because we have veterans, so we can play fast. What's happened is folks have recognized that, so you're seeing a lot more pressing mixing up how they play us defensively. They're really trying to slow us down. And initially that really stifled us, but now we've been working a ton on it in practice on, okay, what do you do when people throw this press at you? When they throw a press at you, we've got to be prepared to still stay aggressive. The aggressive piece of it though, I felt it's been really consistent and I like that we were able to go right in the flow. We've got to just figure out now how to get to the, the great shots that we did if people are slowing us down. You know, earlier you mentioned how it's so fun to coach this group every day when you wake up. Um, what are some of the things that make them so fun? What are some of their qualities and characteristics that kind of give you that that's motivation? A good, that's a good question, Jude. So I can tell you, number one, they're, they're brainiacs. They're really smart. Mm-hmm. It's very different to coach them. Initially, I, 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 it, there are some difficulties because they ask a lot of questions. But at the end of the day, I know that they're really trying to get better. They want to get better. The other piece about them is they're just really fun to hang out with. So in like some of the fun, quirky moments, we can kind of go back and forth, um, talk about silly things, but then be serious at the same time. And that makes it really enjoyable. It makes it really enjoyable. And I'm very fortunate that I've got a core group that I've seen grow from freshmen, and then you add in some of the transfers as well. So just watch them go through those stages makes it really special because you kind of turn into a parent. So there's times where you're sitting there just like, man, I remember when. <laughs> and so you do a lot of that. So it just make, makes it a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, this group is unique in the Sun Belt in that there wasn't a whole lot of turnover. I think you only brought in three new players. Mm-hmm. Um, how have you seen that continuity help you guys through the season so far? So it goes back to one of the things that Deshaun was just talking about. That is, we were able to play. We were Well, we are playing fast. Mm-hmm. Folks throw us down. So because there's a, there's a fami- familiarity that way, I think that's been really good. Interesting enough, though, because we truly only had Denasia and Kennedy as, as mainstays, we're integrating in new players. Mm-hmm. Um, and, they're, and they're trying to figure that out as well. But I feel like that's been really beneficial. And a lot of the off-court mentoring has, has been really good. And there's, a, there's very little um, 
having to get after them in the classroom because I think they really understand what that means as well as a true understanding of what the conference looks like even though there's been turnover on a lot of rosters they really have a good understanding of okay this is what a Troy looks like this is what a Arkansas State looks like this is what a UTA looks like and I think that's positive you're not having to explain the intangibles when you go into a game they already understand in terms of three-point shooting, I saw the team, I think y'all are around 30%, somewhere around there. Is that somewhere that y'all emphasize, or is it more trying to score inside the paint? What are some of your team's uh, strong suits and the things that you're trying to do this season on offense? So for sure, we're looking to score in the paint. I, I would tell you I've evolved as a coach. I went from being one of the top three-point shooting teams in my first six years um, to just through recruiting, honestly, through recruiting. Uh, we, we have young women who can really score in the paint, and so that's either off the bounce um, we got to get better at the free throw line. We're getting the free throw line. we got to get better at the free throw line. And then, obviously, those post feeds inside. Was that an intentional change for you through recruiting to, to be go from more perimeter focus to more interior focus? It wasn't intentional. I just think it's how it's evolved. If you take a look at women's basketball, there aren't a lot of prolific three-point shooters out there mm -hmm. um, from a recruiting standpoint. In addition to that, well, we moved our line back this year. So you're moving your line back. There's a lot of things strategy-wise well, they're moving back to the same, you know, the same length as the men's. Yeah. Strategy-wise, within this season, I think it's going to be really difficult. You're not going to see really high shooting percentages from the three. Right, 30 is actually considered good, and really back in the day, it's like, oh, it's just okay. Mm -hmm. But 30 is not bad within this season with that change. So it, it wasn't intentional. It's just how things have evolved. Yeah. Just heading into that game against Dartmouth tomorrow, um, what are some of the things that you guys want to accomplish? tomorrow, but then also what are some things that you guys are still looking to improve on going into Sunbelt play? So consistency and rebounding for sure. We've got to do a better job with that. Consistency at the free throw line, right? And being able to hand if they decide to, to throw the press at us, continuously be able to handle a press scenario. Those are things that we have to get better at. Um, things that I want to continue to see that we do well is scoring in the paint. Like just we've done a much better job of scoring the paint. Sharing the ball, I think that's another piece of it, sharing the ball and understanding how to still play fast in those scenarios. But for the most part, um, of course I'm, I'm disappointed in those closer games, but we're not in a, a, a stressful place. We're in a pretty good place right now, but yeah, there's specifics that we need to see from a consistency standpoint. Um, you know, one of those players that are really helping you score in the paint is Jada Reed. I know she had the career high 19 points um, on Monday against UTEP, and it, it's been interesting because she she missed all of last year with, mm -hmm. with the injury, and I feel like she's playing at a really high level this season. What has it taken for her to get back to this point? It's exciting because Jada just has a want-to attitude, right? She really has a want-to attitude. She's playing with a lot more confidence. Her and Coach Team have been really working hard at, at specific things regarding her ability to be able to, you know, be more balanced, understanding where she's going to get her scores. And she's efficient, right? She's not a fancy player. She's not going to be that Denasia Hood back to the basket, have a ton of counter moves. She's, she's just really efficient, and she's difficult to guard. She's very difficult to guard. And I think now that she's found that she's seen some success, she's enjoying it, and we're all just really happy for her. Yeah. In terms of women's basketball, where else have you seen it evolve besides maybe that three-point line moving back or things of that sort? So freedom of movement right now, you, you've, okay. you've probably recognized they're, they're calling a lot more fouls, so there's more offense, which I, I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. A you know, more defensive-minded coach can be upset about that, but I think there's some positives to that, allowing some freedom of movement for scores. The other piece is, and I, I kind of wish my counterpart, men's college men's basketball would move to this, is the quarters. The quarters are awesome. Yeah. I mean, you're really breaking it down to you know short periods of time. Everyone, FIBA, high school, we all have quarters. So it's really exciting because you can really focus in on this is our goal. If you fall from that goal, then you can you have another quarter to get it done. So from a strategy standpoint, and specifically with this Gen Z, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? Because it's a condensed period of time that you're trying to accomplish a goal. If you do anything too long, like a long email, like you're not trying to, like it's just it's still too much. <laughs> But something really short like this, it's pretty awesome. You add in the, you know, the timeouts. It's been pretty cool to see, and I think it makes it a lot more fun. Uh, the transition of, with my eyes of going from, and probably the same for you guys, of watching every basketball uh, avenue there is outside of men's basketball. When you first started watching then men's basketball, the 20, 20 minutes, you're kind of like, oh, geez. <laughs> Like, oh, oh wow, we're, we're only at 16? You know what I mean? So <laughs> um, I, I've made the transition now after it's been a couple of years, but I think it's been very good for the game of women's basketball for sure. And, and they're really trying to update. I don't know if you noticed the snazzy new uh, uniforms that the mm -hmm. officials are wearing now, right? They're trying to update themselves. They've relaxed the rules on what student athletes can wear now at the NCAA, which I like that too. I mean, why does it matter what kind of sleeve they wear and what color it is as long as, you know, they're, they look uniform? So I, I do like that as well. So I think 
just giving a little bit more freedom back to the players and even the officials has been a good thing for the game. Earlier, Drew mentioned Jada Reed, and I remember four years ago when I was a freshman covering her and she was getting career highs, so it's ironic to see that, but um, she's a part of that 2018 class that is kind of the leadership group mm -hmm. of this team. What are some of the qualities of Ja'Kayla, Kennedy, Denasia, and Jada uh, that really kind of just make them who they are? I think the, the first piece of that is they're just genuine young women, um, and they all come from just great families. I think that's where it started for them. And the other piece is, is they have a vision and a want to. I think they hit a point where they're tired of hearing about that 2018 class, and they really wanted to set their own tone. They had a setback with COVID. COVID was very difficult, and we still have remnants of COVID right now. Um, so that attitude that they have, is, it was really awesome to see because that is a leadership you need in the locker room when not everyone's kind of been through the fires the way they have, or maybe you went through COVID, but you weren't necessarily playing just yet. Like the vision is very different and they know that they have this opportunity that's really special in front of them. So I appreciate that piece of their leadership. Coach, this is a question I asked you before the season started, but I want to know, are you, do you feel like you're tougher on guards or on posts? Well, I will be honest, if you ask the forts today, they would definitely tell you I was all up <laughs> in it today. I was down there blocking shots, fouling people. It was a lot of fun. And I was talking to Coach Jay. I was like, I bet the guards are happy. I wasn't on their end for once. But if you had to say overall, I'm definitely tougher on the guards because it's a guards game. Mm -hmm. And everyone has to understand that everything's controlled by the guards. So it's really important. Tempo on defense, tempo on offense, right? Their ability to understand and see everything because they play facing the rim. Mm -hmm boards play back to the basket as well as facing the rim and they don't get as many touches so I'm definitely harder on, on the guards for sure but not, not today today the fours the fours got it live defense no pad just it was a lot of fun for me right. <laughs> well for your bigs they have a point guard who is going to get them the ball oh, yeah. in Kennedy. Uh, what's it been like watching her game evolve from the time she stepped here to now? And I know her turnover to assist ratio um, has dropped tremendously from the time she came to now. So what are some of the things you've seen her evolve at since she's been here? You know, when she first got here, the transition from high school to college was really, really tough, right? She didn't start until six games into conference play. That's really because of the speed of the game. So she always saw the floor well. She just didn't understand, you know, defense is getting in, deflecting it, steals. But the time she got caught up, the kid's amazing, I'll be honest with you. There's things when you're watching film that you don't even see in games. You know that saying, she makes chicken salad out of you know what. She really does sometimes, because she can get really deep. A lot of times guards will over-penetrate, and they get stuck, they're turning the ball over. She'll over-penetrate in the paint, she'll come right back out. Next thing you know, you know, teammate has the ball and they just, I said, you know, she sets the table, y'all just got to eat. It's, it's been wonderful to see a young woman of her size, a young woman who busts her butt off the court, who went from valedictorian to an honor student here, to, you know, now she's going into her master's program. Um, the pressure is very serious. The one thing I do worry about for Kennedy is that she accepts so much responsibility that there are definitely times where I know it's got to be really tough because she's, you know, seen as someone that everyone looks to and uh, I know there's times where she feels like she can't make a mistake and it's she, you're gonna make some and I really wanted to be able to play with that freedom hence Jonna is huge as far as being able to kind of take some of that pressure off her because John is a pretty good player in her own right and T tell us a little bit about bringing Jonna in and and how you were able to I mean what was what was kind of your vision in bringing her into the team so my vision was very similar to the two point guard systems we had before and that is being able to push tempo with either player, knowing that Kennedy was shooting it really well last year, she has the ability to score, as well as if you just watch Jonna on film, right? This is a kid who's playing 20 plus minutes at Texas Tech in a high octane offense, and then life hit her and she was out. She didn't play for 19 months until she had, you know, the gut that started at Baylor, and she's still evolving as a player. So seeing what I saw on film, knowing what her goals and aspirations are, right? She's a kid from Oklahoma who still wanted to play basketball after all of this. Um, I knew that she'd come in here hungry. She just needs a lot of love and a lot of confidence. Um, and I feel like she's getting that game by game. She really, really loves the game. And I, I'm excited for her because she's going to be able to, well, she currently is helping us, but she's going to be able to exponentially help us when we hit conference play because she can do similar things to Kennedy. They're different players, but, they're, but there's a lot of things they do really well together. Hey, Sean, you were going to say something. I forgot now. You took my you took my shine. So yeah. uh, we'll move on. <laughs> well, going back to Kennedy a little bit, we had the pleasure of having her on our staff over the summer. Um, what's it like seeing these girls grow off the court and do things like that uh, as a coach? I'll be honest with you, Jude. I was surprised how much she enjoyed it because I wasn't sure. It's very different than what she was used to in the class, which you hear about in the classroom. But she's like, Coach, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm getting to 
understand and know athletes from a completely different, right, view set. And I was like, oh, that's good, Kennedy. Because we talked about, I think she covered a track athlete, she covered a baseball athlete, and she was able to learn a lot as well as she had a connector, right? She was able to connect with them as, as a student athlete as well. So I was really happy that she had this opportunity because I think it's only made her better and she's somebody who is gonna pay it forward, right? With her teammates, she's someone who now can pay it forward with her own brother. Her, her, her brother's a pretty special player at A&M and I know there's times she's probably mentoring him with everything that he's going through as well. And so this experience that she's had here has just been great. I'm really excited for her next step, you know, after she graduates as well um, and I kind of, I threw a little question out there to myself a week or two ago about, well, if this thing goes really well, do you see yourself playing, you know, beyond college? He's like, you know, I'm not, you, I don't know yet. I was like, no pressure. So we'll talk about it later. <laughs> I don't even want you to be thinking about that just yet. But, you know, if she stays on this track and our team keeps growing, she might have an opportunity, even though, you know, her size makes it difficult because her numbers are phenomenal. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of different perspectives, you know, you're a coach who was a former D1 player. And so I wanted to ask a little bit about Zenere Antoine, the player rather oh. than the coach. Um, so starting off, do you have a favorite road trip as a p player? It's a very good question. I had quite a few. So I was very fortunate. I played under two different coaches, but both had the same philosophy. As student athletes, you go out, when you play on the road, you get to know the lay of the land. And I learned this probably my sophomore year. We went out to Anaheim and went to Disneyland at a big tournament. <laughs> and there were other teams there. And I sat with a group of other student athletes. Because back then they'd have these banquets. You sit with other student athletes. And uh, we were just talking about how we went to Disneyland and all the fun things we did. And I asked the young woman next to me, I think she played it. Yeah. She's either Auburn or Alabama. I don't remember. But she's like, we didn't do anything. We just sat in a hotel. And my mouth dropped. I was like, that's sad that we were in a break and you didn't have an opportunity to get out and really grow and learn. Um, so I have multiple trips that I loved. I will tell you, I love Disneyland, I love Disney World, I love New York, but I would probably tell you if I had to pick one trip for sure, it probably would have been, we played at Hawaii because they were in our conference, so it's not even Hawaii. I would tell you it's New York. New York was awesome. I had a coach who was an old school coach yeah. who let us go ice skating. I don't know if you remember when Rick Neuheisel was at Colorado when he let his guys go skiing and how that was taboo. I had a coach who did the same thing. Like He was like, you guys want to go? We are in Central Park ice skating. I mean, that is pretty special. Yeah. So I would tell you that's probably one of my most memorable moments as a student athlete outside of going to the NCAA tournament. But I think my senior year we went to uh, West Lafayette, and that's no offense to Purdue. It's just not <laughs> the most fun trip outside of the fact that you're playing in the NCAA tournament. Yeah. Um, well, and the other thing I feel like not a whole lot of people know you were teammates with Becky Hammond at Colorado State. And so I wanted to ask if you had any good Becky Hammond stories. That I can share. Oh. I feel like that's everybody. <laughs> you know what? Um, the one thing I always appreciate about Becky, she was exactly who you think she was. She was the first one in the gym, last one out. Always talking with the head coach, always thinking about basketball, always putting herself out there. Um, she's from a small town in South Dakota. I think she's really grounded in who she is and her family, which I really appreciate that about Becky as well. But. Um, we had a lot of fun as student athletes back in the day. See, this is before uh, social media, before smartphones, but barely before the internet, to be honest with you. So we'll, we'll just keep some of those fun secrets okay. uh, secrets or team memories. Well, but uh, she, was a, she was a very good teammate. I, I've, I've, I remember reading about her that she's a big hip hop fan. Do you remember anything about her hip hop tastes? No, not, not specifically, but her and another teammate of mine, Katie Cronin, were, were close friends. Okay. Um, and there may or may not have been a rap battle. Oh. Katie probably is definitely better than Becky. Oh. Um, uh oh. But, you know, she was, she was kind of like that wingman, I guess you'd say. Yeah. More so than, like, the, you know, the, the featured artist. Okay. Were you ever in the rap battle? No, I was, I was not. <laughs> my, my role was cooking. That's what I did. I, I, threw, I threw down like I do with my team now. Like, the team would always come over and everybody come hang out and eat. I would cook quite a bit actually for my teammates. That's what I enjoyed to do. Oh, wait, weren't, wasn't Coach Z and Coach TJ supposed to have a cook-off? I don't mind any time. That's right. They were supposed right. to have a cook uh, Yes, he like claims it. his gumbo is pretty good, but. I, I gotta see it. You I don't mind. Us three judge, we're not biased. I do not here. mind, I do not mind. Y'all name the date, place, time, I, I, I plan to prep. Biased, though. Oh, from Louisiana. From Louisiana. Oh, that's fine, he's from Louisiana, but I learned from my father-in-law my father-in-law is from Louisiana, hence the last name Antoine, and that's where I learned. And I have Pops' gumbo pot, the same pot that I used, that he used when we were student athletes. He would bring, he brought that pot all the way out to Colorado State, because that's my, my husband and I were, were college sweethearts. And that's where I learned. And what he would do is, he's a country guy from, uh, 
from New Roads, Louisiana, he would pack backpacks full of sausage and dried shrimp, and then he'd get the rest out there. He'd put gizzards, hearts, everything else in it. Now, I, I kind of keep that part out. Right. <laughs> but he has this really special pot. So I, I have a true Louisiana background when it comes to making gumbo. Well, then we're going to have to challenge TJ, I think. I, 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 this is any open challenge <laughs> on the mic. <laughs> You looking at me? Yep. Is it my turn? I think so. Great. It's not my turn. It's Jude's turn. Really. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyways, just um, thinking about this year and also some of the other players aside from just that 2018 group and that senior class. Um, who are some players that have stood out to you that have stepped up this season um, and really given you all some help off the bench? So it is still pretty early, but I will say this: um, I feel like Gabby does a great job for us coming off the bench. I know she struggled this last game shooting the basketball, but what people don't realize about her, she's a really good communicator. But she's also a really driven young woman, um, which I really like. She got her degree from Fresno State in two years and then came here now as in our master's program is going to be able to complete her degree and, and go into elementary ed to be a kindergarten teacher. And what you see on the floor is somebody who's a really good teacher. Like she's constantly talking, communicating with others. And I think that's really good. So that is really added to the landscape in a way that people don't necessarily see. I think people are really excited to see Sierra Dixon grow because she's just so young. She's just a sophomore, but we all know she's got a lot of Taylor Deer, you know, tendencies as far as being able to get shifty, get in the paint, finish. You know, I'm really excited about what the future looks like for her as well. Um, Gosh, I really could go on and on because I like our depth. I, I think that's the one thing that we do have is we have some depth, especially at the forward spot. All right, Chelsea Johnson had a start for us. All right, Chelsea, Jada, and Lauren have all started at some point, and so I think that adds to it. And then Nicole Leff has been out, and she's a local product right up from the Austin area, and she just is you know, getting back healthy again. And once she gets back into play, I think what you'll find is she's a really good combination of like a a Danesia type player and that she can, she's a lefty, but she can shoot the ball, she can put the ball on the floor as well, and she can score back to the basket. So once we get her rolling, and she's just in her sophomore year too, I think she's going to be a really special player here long term. Well, what I was going to ask was about recruiting specifically. Mm -hmm. I see that you guys do a lot of recruiting in state. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about this state that you just, obviously it's bigger than everywhere else, but about this state, you got Dallas, you got some Austin. I know you have people from Westlake on the team, mm -hmm. which means it's right here. So uh, what is it about this state that just makes it you know, a good place to recruit or an easier place to recruit for you guys? Well, I would tell you the one thing is, one, I'm, I'm from Texas, so this is home. So it, it, it's there's a comfort level there about being home. So you can get transfers that are coming back home as well as you're able to recruit in this state. The other piece is, and I took a look at this a long time ago as a young assistant, if you take a look at the evolution of just recruiting in general and women in sport, you ought to take a look at the, the what I consider the big states, Ohio, Michigan, Florida, Texas, California, right? So a lot of those states have high-level men's athletes. So a lot of those guys are now like me, they're Gen Xers, they're dads, right? And so there's an expectation. They, they came up with student athletes like me as far as equity and what they expect. So now these dads are heavily involved in their daughter's sport, no different than they would be in their son's sport. So there's an expectation and a standard set in place. When you have that level of coaching, from a very young uh, age group all the way up obviously through high school, you know you're getting high quality athletes. And so I think what has happened is you do see a great transformation of really good players in women's sports from those particular states. There is a there is a high level of play, but as well as there's just a lot of volume as far as how many student athletes are available out there. So I think that's, that's exciting. Um, the other piece is too, we have quite a few different conferences within our, our state as well. And I think that does play into it because not everyone wants to play in one particular conference. Some young people like the idea of playing and being able to go to different, especially young women, going to different states and different areas, which I think is really cool as well. That's a very good question, though, yeah. regarding recruiting. I thought you were going to ask a portal question. I was going to go. Oh, there. no, no. I'm <laughs> especially the on N yeah, NLI <laughs> day, day for football. Yeah. Avoid the portal. <laughs> Well, C Coach, when you when you look at Texas specifically, you know, do you notice certain differences about players when you pull them from different parts of the state? Like, because I know you love pulling from Houston because it's your hometown. Is there anything specific about you know pulling from Houston, pulling from Dallas, pulling from West Texas, anything like that? Are there differences? For sure. The There's it's it's just like our people right here in Texas. They, they 
the stereotypes that we that, that we hear about, some of it is relatively true as far as you get a kid from East Texas to West Texas, they're tough. I mean, they're, they're, they're tough, right? Maybe not necessarily country, but there's a toughness to them. They're not growing up in the, the like I like to make fun of, the majority of our team is from the Dallas area. Mm -hmm. So I like to make fun of the Dallas girls being from Houston all the time, the shine, you know, it's <laughs> so pretty. So uh, th there is that difference. And then you have the kids from Houston, there's a little bit more edge to them, depending on where they're from. Um, and Central Texas just has its own, we just have our own vibe, which I really think is really neat. Um, whether it be, you know, Denasia Hood from San Antonio, or like we have a kid from Westlake, or Nicole Leff. I, I think the one constant you have is being from Texas is really, really cool. We've got the two kids from Oklahoma, I keep telling them we're turning them at Texans, and I think they both are planning on staying afterwards. It, it's just a really nice Texas melting pot because when we do leave, there's certain things that are understood. And you really don't understand that after you've left, because I played out of state. It, you feel isolated when you leave the state of Texas. It's just kind of hard to explain. It's, it's just, it truly is its own culture in some way, so that leaks into the basketball piece of it. So there are differences, differences in music for sure. I would tell you, it's probably the biggest difference that when they are together is the differences in what they prefer musically. Um, I would say that's probably one of the biggest differences. But outside of that, you know, no, not, not too much, not too much. Is there a certain genre you hear more musically on the buses or here with them? Or in I'll be honest, I don't even recognize that stuff coming out of oh. Dallas. So, and then on top of that, I'm from that old school, that old school UGK, mm -hmm. you know, Bun B age. So <laughs> even then, even some of the newer stuff in Houston, I got to turn to my brother and, and find out like what's, what's going on because I cannot, I can't hang. I'm too old school. I'm straight like 90s. Yep. It's definitely music. You know, earlier you kind of mentioned how there were certain traits about people on the team regarding their generation, like Gen Z. How do you kind of evaluate that, like whenever it comes to bringing in players? Like, is that something that you guys look at? You try to look at maybe some societal trends and like big picture stuff? That's not something that I've heard from a coach, so I thought that was really interesting. I, I, I do a lot of reading. So I happen to have 12-year-old uh, sons who are going to be 13, so they're part of the Gen Z. And then I got a little guy, he's gonna be a Gen Alpha. I do a ton of reading, honestly, generationally speaking, right? Because you got the boomers, the Gen Xers, the millennials, and then Gen Z. And is there a difference? There's definitely a difference from the top end of Gen Z to the bottom end of Gen Z. Um, so what I found is I coach definitely probably from a more loving and caring place with Gen Z. Just because your generation specifically has had so much opportunity and information overload that there is a want and a need for that, and that old school Gen X boomer style doesn't always necessarily cut it because there's not an understanding of, there's love behind you, you can't tell, you don't know, is it, is it genuine or is it not? Especially, you know, if you're just scrolling a lot of times from one thing to the next, it's very difficult to, to really get to know folks. So I spend time really more so getting on the level of being more of a listener now. I've definitely changed, I'm a much better listener. And if there looks like there's confusion, I really want to talk it out. And that's where I want to give back to our athletes. Like, let's talk. It's not, it's uncomfortable. Let's please talk it out. Let's talk through whatever's going on so I can better understand you and you can understand where I'm coming from. And so there's a lot more talking, honestly, for me in my coaching style than there was in the past. All right. Well, Coach, I think we're going to get to our football picks now. Okay. All right. Our okay. picks are brought to you by the Matt Kyle Law Firm. Matt Kyle is a 10-time super lawyer and a friend of the Daily Record. So coach, we're gonna have you pick all the bowl games okay. in the next week here. Um, I'm gonna warn you now, our Texas State folks haven't done that well on our podcast this, this semester. Okay, no pressure, um, no pressure, no Ken pressure. Kennedy went two and eight. Um, I think Emily DeWalt went two and eight. Janelle Fitzgerald, three and seven. Sean Hewitt, I think also three and seven. Okay, I gotta be Coach Sean. Um, That's okay. my goal. Don, Don Coriel, four and eight. Um, the one outlier is Cannon Webb. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a, he's a wide receiver on the football team. Um, he went inside. He's got inside He went seven knowledge. and three. Okay. So that's that's our record. It's a winning right record. Now. Okay. That's, that's, got that's it. That's the record right now. So that's the bar. Got it. So here we go, Coach. We're gonna start you off with Middle Tennessee versus Toledo. Who do you like in that one? Are you gonna name the bowl and where it's being played? Because you know. Should, okay. Me, all right. So all right. So up. I'm I'm leaning towards Middle Tennessee, and I say that I'm gonna take a very uh, sentimental approach to this one because. The young woman that we have that we signed coming in from Tennessee, her dad is a Hall of Famer and was just inducted. And so I'm gonna go with Middle Tennessee. Okay. Um, up next, we have Northern Illinois versus Coastal DeKal. Carolina. Oh, you know, I gotta go with Coastal Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about Coastal Carolina, the basketball team. They're doing really well. They're getting a couple of votes right now. Um, they, they actually just took their first loss 
today to a tough St. Mary's mm -hmm. team. So I'll be curious to take a look at them. You know, they, they hit COVID like no other meaning that they missed maybe seven or eight games last year. There's a lot of games they missed, so I'll be curious to see what that team looks like, because I know they've picked up quite a few portal kids, as, as we call them. Right. All right, I'm, I've almost got this. <laughs> I've almost got this. That's okay. Yeah, it right. does make a difference, right? Because if you're Where talking, at, yeah, it yeah. does. Because you said Coastal, think where Coastal is, and then you're DeKalb. You mm -hmm. all been to DeKalb? DeKalb. <laughs> oh, when you, go, when you go to DeKalb, where uh, Northern Georgia, Illinois right? is. No, where Northern Illinois oh, I is. you're talking about DeKalb. Oh, Georgia. DeKalb is where Northern Illinois is. Corn fields for days, oh. freezing cold. So. Where you play does make a difference. You know, Coastal's used to that nice weather. True. They might get a little True. bit of the breeze that you get, but I'm thinking to myself, well, man, it depends on where they're playing. And Drew is still. Still. App State, well. App State is, I think, the next game. I don't remember what they're playing, but App State's in the He next got the one. games. He's trying to figure out where exactly. Well, that's right. <laughs> Sorry for putting because all this spot on The bowl games are different. It's not like they just play at home. Correct. Like they play, it like, does make a difference. And there's all the fun it really games. does make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Get the and then they're chilling. The and then they're, they're chilling in these bowl games for quite yep. some time. And there's all the things that they do within the community service. So mm -hmm. depending on the culture of your team or the nature of your team, you might be a little too relaxed. Mm -hmm. All right. We've got the list. We've okay. got the list now. Okay. okay. So so Middle Tennessee versus Toledo. That's the Bahamas Bowl. It's in the Bahamas. You still like your pick? I still like my pick. All right. Next was Northern Illinois and Carolina in the Cure Bowl in Orlando, Florida. Do you like Coastal? Right yeah, yeah. Coastal. Right. Next we have Western Kentucky versus App State in the Boca Raton Bowl. So that's hard, okay? The Hilltoppers are pretty darn good and they're tough. They're physically tough. But, you know, App has, from being in Boone, they're pretty tough as well. So I'm going to go with, right now, our conference, I'm going to go with App. Okay. Um, next is UTEP versus Fresno State in the New Mexico Bowl. UTEP had a great season, yep. okay. but I watched Fresno, and that quarterback is a tough kid. My husband used to coach there uh, at Fresno when uh, Derek Carr was playing, so I got to go with Fresno. I didn't know that. That's yeah. interesting. Um, up next is BYU. BYU. Has, Hands yeah, down. Yeah, I don't yeah, even know who it is. It's UAB. Yeah, no, BYU. And the that run game, and they're, and they're tough. They're tough. They're it's tough. in Louisiana, though, Coach. It's right uh, BYU. BYU. And we got to remember, <laughs> I played in a conference where we played um, – with the LDS community, and they are older. Some are married, some are parents, mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm going with BYU. Right. She's sticking with BYU. <laughs> um, next is Eastern Michigan versus oh. Liberty in the Lending Tree Bowl. Liberty, Alabama. I'm going with Liberty, because I think the, the coach that got a little bit of hot water at Ole Miss, right, is at Liberty now. Hugh Freeze. Hugh Freeze is a very good coach. Uh, nothing against the uh, opponent, but I'm gonna go with Liberty in that case. You know, Eastern Michigan beat Texas State in football this year. Does that make a difference? You know, when I saw that post afterwards, and I was pretty heated, but no, I'm still gonna go with Liberty. I'm gonna trust my gut on that one. All right, um, next is Utah State versus Oregon in the LA Bowl. Oregon Las State. Right. Oregon State, thank you, Jude. Where are they playing? Uh, Los LA. Angeles, the LA Bowl. Utah State's pretty tough, too. Uh, I'm going to have to go with Oregon State on this one. That, that's a tough one. That's a really tough one. Right. Just going Oregon State. I'm just going purely on the fact the conference that they play in mm -hmm. to yep. prepare them. Um, next we have Sunbelt champion Louisiana taking on Marshall in the New Orleans Bowl. I think that's a tough one because of the coaching change. Um, I actually don't know a lot about Marshall. Back, last time I was watching, Byron Leftwich was, was playing back then. So um, Chad Pennington, that was a long time ago. So I'm going to go with uh, our Sun Belt Conference champs with, with Louisiana. All right. Um, next up is Tulsa versus Old Dominion in the Myrtle Beach Bowl at Conway. i got to be honest, I don't know either way. So I'm okay. going to go. Oh, that's tough, guys. Do you want the records, Coach? I don't know if that helps, but go ahead. They're both six and six. Oh, oh this guy here. This guy. Let's go with ODU. Let's go with ODU. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, any thoughts about ODU and the other new members of the Sun Belt coming in? The only thing I can tell you is years ago, and we probably have to go back to the 80s, in women's basketball, that was a premier school that had been to Final Fours. Outside of that, I've actually never been there. I've been to so many places in this country. I've never been there. So I am excited from a women's basketball standpoint. I don't know enough about their other sports to really have an educated okay. opinion. All right. um, next up is Kent State, who I think just won the MAC um, versus tough conference. Wyoming in the. Famous well, listen, Idaho I went to Colorado State, so I'm not. I'm never rooting for the Cowboys. Okay. So <laughs> that, yeah. that was the famous Idaho Potato Bowl. Yeah. Idaho potato. Um, next up, oh, this is gonna be a tough one. UTSA versus San Diego State in the Frisco Bowl. 
Oh, they're playing at the Star? They are playing. I have to go with UTSA, go. sadly. Oh. Um, you got to be smart. In this case, we're talking about picks. UTSA. All right, she's going for the win. Um, last one, Coach. Army versus Mizzou in the Armed Forces Bowl. That's... Uh, I didn't watch Missouri this year. Army just lost to Navy. Missouri went 6-6 yeah. and six yeah. in the SEC. I'm actually still going to... I'm still going to go with Army. You can't go wrong, you know, with the Armed Forces, right? Either way. All right. Well, Coach, thank you so much for coming yeah, on this Yeah, I week. hope I get a winning record in this. <laughs> for sure. Everybody says that. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> you didn't go with my overall pick. I don't have one yet, though. I still, it's kind of tough. All right, Deshaun, if people miss any part of this episode, where can they find the rest of the podcast? Jude, if people miss the rest of this episode, where can they find this podcast? They can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can go to Anchor. There's Google Podcasts. I think it's on. There's a bunch of other places, but mainly Apple, Spotify. And then if you want to watch it, you can watch it on Twitter, at SMDR Sports, or you can watch it on YouTube or Facebook. So, And Deshaun, if they wanted to find our content online where can they find it at the smdr sports page on twitter that is not correct you can find deshaun's basketball stories on the high school games oh, yeah. at sanmarcusrecord.com slash sports you can also find my gamer on tomorrow's matchup against dartmouth on there um and we will be back next week wednesday at 6 p.m at the original blacks barbecue